Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you're welcome to the class today. I want to welcome everyone of Night Cohort on behalf of the Electoral College Nigeria. Thank you for coming. And um, let's wait for like five minutes to have everybody come around so we could start. Uh, however, um, please, when you're arriving, note that you're supposed to write your name on the chat box and possibly where you're, where you're um, attending from, the state you're attending from. Um, when it comes to questions, you can actually write your questions in the comment section. If you can't wait till the end of the lecture, you can write it in the comment section. And um, please note that uh, we'll wait till the end of the lecture to have questions and answers. Thank you. Except otherwise stated by the facilitator who might want to engage the students. Um, except that, please let's write our questions and wait for the end of the question of the lectures before we have questions and answers. Thank you. Okay, so uh, it is uh, five minutes past five, so we should be starting now. Um, you're all welcome. So our facilitator for today is by name, Tony Usidamen, who is a renowned commission, 
communications expert and social commentator. He is the founder of Uburu, a Nigerian-based marketing communications consultancy, providing services to individuals, businesses, and governments across West Africa. Tony is also an advocate of good governance and civic responsibility. He is the convener of I Am Edo, a movement of young Edo professionals, which seeks to inspire pride and patriotism in all of Edo people. Please should I ask us to welcome tonight, uh, Mr. Usidane. Thank you. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can, sir. Can you we confirm can. that you can hear me? Everybody can, sir. Oh, okay, great. I will we just try sure to it. share. Yes, I want to try to share my presentation. Just a second. That's proven a bit of the challenge. Sorry, everyone, just um, trying to share my screen. I, I don't know why I can't. Okay, I think now I should be able to. Can I do this? I sincerely apologize. I mean, I've done this several times before, but for some reason I, I can't seem to, to, to be able to, to share. I'm sorry, do you have a facilitator? Do you happen to have the, the presentation? If you can share on my behalf. Uh, we, we are, uh, well. Do you have, does, does Wumi have my presentation so you can share on my behalf? I, I don't understand why I'm unable to. I think we had this problem. No, time. no, sir, I don't. You did not send it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Keep going around and I still can't find how to share this. Um, can, can we take five minutes? Let me send this to you, um, Wumi. Let me send this to you and then maybe you can, you can share for me. Let's take um, five minutes. That's fine, sir. All right. Sorry, be right back. Okay, so in the interim, I want to believe that there's a very good opportunity for... Um, the cohorts to start calling each other so that they could all actually attend uh, the class. Uh, and just note that uh, it will not be a nice idea if everyone leaves before the class ends. Please, it, will, it is not a good idea that anyone leaves before the class ends. Thank you.
Hi, Wumi, you should have the, the presentation now, if you could please be kind enough to share. I apologize to the class um, for this. This should have been sorted before now, and it's, it's not in the character of the Electoral College. Um, I take responsibility for this. We, we, we should have tested this before. Um, but notwithstanding, once Wumi puts it up, we'll get on the way very quickly. Hello, sir. Can you see it now? Yes, yes, I can see it now. Thank you very much, Omi. Um, once again, class, can we start now? Yes, we can start, sir. Can okay, start. great. Uh, please, could you move on to the, to the next slide? Let's skip all the introductions. You already did the introduction. Yes, yeah, so um, as you know, our topic today is democracy and citizen participation. So for this class, we're going to be exploring different forms of government. We would look at anarchism, what it means, autocracy, oligarchy, and then of course our main theme of today, democracy. Uh, we'll go delve deeper into the uh, concept of democracy. We'll look at the variants of democracy and the challenges of democracy. And then we'll go into citizenship, what it means, um, exploring two critical concepts, the concept of citizens, as users and consumers, and the concept of citizens as shapers and makers. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yes, the next. So, what is government? In, in simple terms, government is the body with the power to make and enforce laws to control a country, a land area, a people, or an organization. Um, so even in companies, you have a form of government, which is why most times you hear concepts like corporate governance. That means go go government simply means Anybody that controls, that has the power to control, enforce laws um, for a particular country, land area, or organization. That is what government is. And most societies agree that the existence of government is morally justified. Now, let's look at the different forms of government, the most popular forms of government there are. The next slide, please.
Okay, so um, these are the most popular forms of government that there are. The first is anarchism. Anarchism simply means rule by none. I mean, when, when you think of anarchism, you can think of Fela's um, uh, Confucian song. Remember that Fela song? Motto they come from left, motto they come from right, policeman no day for center. Just think of a crossroad with cars coming from different directions and there is no traffic warning, no traffic lights, nobody to control the movement, vehicular and uh, human movement. It's, it's normally a state of confusion. And this is what anarchism is. Um, of course, you, you don't expect to find this kind of government, but for academic purposes, it's important that we know that there exists a system of government known as anarchism, which is ruled by none. Following anarchism is autocracy, and autocracy simply means rule by one. That's self-rule. It's a system of government in which supreme power is concentrated in the hands of one person or polity. Um, if you think autocracy, you think of countries like Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Oman, Brunei, and then for absolute, um, uh, for dictatorships, you think of countries like North Korea. Those are the uh, examples of modern day uh, places where autocratic systems of government exist. And then there's another form of government, popular form of government called oligarchy. And oligarchy simply means rule by a few. It's a form of power structure in which power rests with a small number of people. Now, there are different forms of um, rule under the oligarchy. You can have the aristocracy, which is rule by the nobility. Um, if you have noble birth, power is automatically uh, transferred from one generation to another, almost like the, like the monarchies. And then there is the plutocracy, which is simply rule by the wealthy. It's also a form of oligarchy. And there's, a, there's meritocracy, which is um, ruled by the meritorious, the most brilliant, the inventors, the scientists, you know, the critical thinkers who control power within a society. And then finally, there's theocracy, which technically means rule by God. But in this case, a religious elite um, takes that place of God. And, and, uh, an example of a place where you have a theocratic government is Iran. Okay, and then finally, of course, we have democracy, which is ruled by many, um, and we'll delve deeper into what democracy is in our next slide, please. So if I asked any one of us, what does democracy mean to us? Um, we don't have the time to take a, a little poll, but this is a little poll, but this is what um the different answers that i expect from you that democracy is government of the people democracy is the will of the majority democracy is competition for political power democracy is the right to voice your opinions freedom to be part of any organization when you talk about democracy you think immediately equality rights representation you think free markets you think citizen action and then you think elections Next slide. Now let's um, delve deeper into the concept of democracy. Uh, like I said, democracy literally means rule by the people, rule by the majority, unlike the other forms of government that we explored. Remember um, a little recap, we started with um, anarchism, which is rule by none. And then we went to autocracy, which is ruled by one. And then um, we went to oligarchy, which is ruled by a few. Um, in following the same vein, democracy is ruled by many, which is why um, the most popular definition of democracy is a government of the people, by the people, for the people. And how did democracy start? 
um, it's, it's thought to be derived from the Greek word demokratia, which means demos people and kratos rule in the middle of the fifth century. However, um, democratic forms of government existed many, many years, even before it became to be recognized in the form that it is today. Um, as a matter of fact, the thousands of years when human beings survived as hunters, um, gathering things from one community to, to another, democracy was thought to be the natural political system that existed then. Next slide. But as communities grew larger and equality set in, uh, in, in terms of inequality setting in terms of wealth distribution amongst people, amongst communities. It seemed that those who had more power started to um, kind of assert themselves over other people. So a community that seemed to have, that was more prosperous, thought that they could encroach into another community and then make that community a part of them. So as because of inequalities in resources from one place to another and amongst the people, um, the popular forms, the, the more dominant form, that's the democratic form of government gave way for um, things like the monarchy. And that's how um, aristocracy and the likes came to be where a few people um, who had more power, especially, you know, wealth and military might started to um, create like a class and started to control resources and laws governing a people. So this was how um, democracy grew, started from the um, non-literal tribes. And then because of inequalities in resources, it gave way to the to the to what we what we now know as the um, monarchies or the aristocratic um, form of government. Can we go on? Next slide. So um, I would like us to explore the variants of democracy that we have. Uh, there are two major variants of democracy. We have the direct or participatory democracy, and then there's the representative or indirect democracy. Now, the direct democracy is a form of government in which citizens themselves make legislative decisions. They do not delegate the power to elected representative. And this form of government or this, this kind of democracy, this type of democracy is considered to be the purest form of the democracy. Remember, when you say democracy is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. A situation where you have individuals within a geographic space, individuals who make up a, a country directly involved in making legislative decisions that concern them, that is um, direct democracy, and it's thought to be the purest form of democracy because it's at a molecular level where every individual in the community has a say in the laws that govern them. Um, whether this is practiced uh, remains to be seen, but academically, the direct, direct democracy is the purest form of uh, government. And when you think of this, one of the things that come to mind is the Brexit debates and referendum. Uh, the Brexit, Brexit couldn't have happened if the people did not vote um, for Britain to, to leave Europe. So that's an example of what the direct democracy is, which is people participating at a very molecular level. As against representative or indirect democracy, where people elect representatives who will make laws on their behalf and act on their behalf. It's either the, the representatives are trusted to, to carry out um, judgments, to judge situations and make laws on behalf of the people, or the people tell them what they want and the representative carry it out on their behalf, um, which is usually the more common, especially um, in our climes here. Next slide.
Okay, so we've looked at different forms of government. Remember, we've looked at anarchism, we've looked at autocracy, we've looked at, um, what other one did we look at? Oligarchy, and then democracy. Now, what is the comparative advantage that democracy has over other forms of government? First and foremost, it's important to note that no association can maintain a democratic government for a very long time if most of the people do not believe that some other form of government were better. So the reason why democracy as a system of um, governance is so widespread is because people believe that compared to the other forms of government, it is the best that you have um, out there. And um, in theory, states with democratic governments are thought to prevent rule by autocrats. Of course, if more people are involved in, in making decisions about a country or a state, and that prevents individuals from making rules on behalf of everybody or dictating what everybody should do um, within a community. Democracy, in theory, is supposed to guarantee fundamental individual rights, which other forms of government do not guarantee. Democracy allows for a relatively high level of political equality. Remember, I keep saying this is in theory, because as we would see later, even the, the democratic systems that are practiced in different parts of the world aren't without their problems. And then there are arguments as to whether or not democracy should be practiced by countries, you know, everywhere, or whether um, we should look to alternative systems of government, but we'll get to that in a bit. Finally, democracy is thought to provide more prosperity for citizens of a country. Now, what we're doing is comparing um, democracy as, as a system of governance to other forms of government. Next slide. I think it's taking some time to load. Okay, so yes, I, I did mention that democracy, democracy in itself is not without challenges. Um, in a democracy, like in all other dominant forms of government, governments, the actual governance may be influenced by sectors with political power, which are not part of the formal government. What does it mean? Um, let's say, for example, Nigeria. One of the terms that you hear used in government is cabal. Now, when you talk of a cabal, um, usually in this climate, the cabal refers to a small group of people, whether within government or in the private sector, you know, parts of corporations, who, though small, control most of the critical decisions, especially as concerns um, economy and commerce. So you can have a country practicing democracy as Nigeria is, for example, and still have within this democratic system of government, gov government oligarchs, you know, uh, plutocrats, the wealthy, who are still somehow, even within this democracy, uh, influencing decisions that are being made. Meaning that democracy itself, in most places, is not being practiced in its purest form. It can be influenced by uh, external uh, forces. Um, and then sometimes, if you look at Nigeria, sometimes you look at Nigeria, even though we say we're practicing a democracy, sometimes it appears that there is actually nobody in charge of the country. Because sometimes... The president is interviewed about, you know, matters um, affecting the country. And you hear statements like, I did not know. I did not know that it was this bad. I did not know that it was that bad. So even in a democratic institution like ours, with the three arms of government, the legislative, the judiciary, the executive, you can still have a state of anarchy, even in a democratic institution. So what it means is that, Democracy itself 
it's not being practiced in its purest form. It's been influenced by other forms of government. I just think it's important to see the interplay uh, because in making the, the decision as to which is the best form of governance, um, it's important to know the good and the bad of all the different forms of governance in order to be able to decide um, which is the best for a particular geographical territory or people. Next slide, please. Now, let's look at the concept of citizenship. Um, next slide. Citizenship and democracy are like two sides of a coin. Um, the very citizen is, citizenship is tied to the idea of democracy. Democracy is the first name and citizenship is the last name. And we'll, we'll see what that means in a bit. Next slide. Okay, I did mention uh, during my introduction that under citizenship, we want to explore two very important concepts. The first we're exploring is the concept of citizens as users and consumers. Now, since the 18th century, when the concept of citizenship started gaining traction, um, debates around what is expected of citizen have usually been shaped by the government. So what a citizen is expected to do in the country is decided by the government. It is almost as if the people are incapable of deciding how they should contribute or what is good for them within a society. So usually the government would say, this, this, this is what a model citizen should do. And citizens almost always follow blindly. In this case, they do not have a say. But that system of, gov um, of that concept of citizenship, where citizens are just seen as people that follow rules laid down by the government, has changed, as we would see in the next slide, or is changing, as we'll see in the next slide, where citizens, rather than being just consumers, people who follow others, are now seen as participants in the governance of a country, which is as shapers and as makers. New approaches to social citizenship seek to move beyond seeing the state as bestowing rights and demanding responsibilities of subjects. So it's not like a, a master-slave kind of relationship anymore. It used to be like that. Citizenship used to be viewed from the point of view of the roles that the government ascribes to the people. But now we're moving to the concept where the people themselves are part of the ones making um, the laws about things that concern them. And this is, this is where we are today. I thought this quote by the Institute of the Development Studies UK puts it very well, and I, and I like to read it. New approaches to social citizenship seek to move beyond seeing the state as bestowing rights and demanding responsibilities of its subjects. In doing so, they aim to bridge the gap between citizen and the state by recasting citizenships as practiced rather than given. This recognizes the agency of citizens as makers and shapers rather than as users and choosers. So citizens are not people like kids who X, Y, Z, the government dictates what you should do. Citizens are people by virtue of the fact that they have a stake in a country or a community can decide together with the elected representative what is good for them. Um, we're no longer viewing citizens as helpless people who do not have a say, but as people who decide their own fortunes. Next slide. Now, I want us to look at issues in modern day citizenship. Remember that when we, when we started by defining democracy, 
We said democracy is government by many as opposed to the um, others. Remember, we started with anarchism, rule by none, aristocracy, rule by, sorry, autocracy, rule by one, oligarchy, rule by a few, and democracy, rule by the people, rule by many. Now, what it suggests is that when you talk of democracy, you talk of equality, you talk of universality. I mean, theoretically, democracy is supposed to be the most representative form of government that there exists. But do we really have equality? Can, can equality really be, be practiced? Is universal, universality, is it really a theme? Now we'll look at the issues in modern day citizenships. We'll look at the individual versus collective identity. Remember, at the start, um, I was introduced as Tony Sidaman. Um, and apart from being a public relations practitioner, uh, I was introduced as the convener of Ayamedo, which means Tony Sidaman, of course, you know I'm male. Okay, I'm declaring to be male. I, I could be non binary or something, but I'm declaring as a male. And then I'm from Edo. And then I'm Christian. But then there is Wumi who I guess from her name is Yoruba. Um, she could be Christian, she's female. What I'm trying to say is that within a community, there are so many different kinds of people, different religions, different backgrounds, different beliefs. So how is it possible? How is it possible to protect the rights of everybody within a community as diverse as we, we are. There are multiple identities, people defined by race, by gender, by religion, by class, by ethnicity. Today, there's great debates about the rights of LGBT. LGBT, for those who don't know, stands for uh, lesbian, gay, LGBT, bisexuals, and transgenders. It's a major debate outside of Nigeria and the West. And more, more and more people are clamoring for rights. And as you know, I mean, you watch, we're, we're not uh, dissociated from the rest of the world. We see arguments where some people don't want to be identified as he or she. We have non-binary um, categorization where some people prefer to be called they. And one day, the agenda is fluid. Today, they can decide to be males. Tomorrow, they can decide to be females. Now, how do we ensure that the rights of everybody, based given how diverse we are, how do we ensure that the rights of everybody within a society is protected? And is that even really possible? That is one of the issues in modern day citizenship. The individual versus the collective identity. Um, sometimes you find that people say, especially, I mean, let's look at Nigeria, for instance. Uh, people in the Niger Delta are clamoring for resource control because they feel that the oil is coming from their, their place. Why should, you know, um, the monies accruing from the sale of oil be shared in you know, almost the same proportion to states that are not producing oil. Whereas some states, for instance, some people argue, uh, argue that some states in the, in the North are mining um, gold and minerals, and that doesn't go into the um, federal um, allocation for states. So different interests, even within our society, how can we in the democracy ensure that the rights of everybody is protected. Looking at the individual, because as an individual, I have, I have individual rights, but as a collective too, how do we ensure that the collective is protected? Another example I'd like to give um, for individual versus collective, if you cast your mind back, um, some years ago, a lady, a Muslim lady was prevented from I don't know if it was uh, the law school 
or service because of the hijab. Um, I'm sure some of us remember that um, there, was, there was like some debate at the time and she eventually went to court and eventually she was allowed, I think it was service or, or the law school. She was anyway given the permission to go ahead um, wearing our religious veil. Now, these are examples of the problems that exist even within a democracy. How do you ensure that my right as a Muslim Christian, uh, as a Muslim male, or as a Christian female, or as a Babalao, or you know, whatever you practice, as diverse as we are, how can we ensure that everybody's right is protected within a democracy? Another example, um, some years back in the US, a certain baker, cake baker, refused to bake cakes for a gay couple because according to her, um, being gay or lesbian is sinful and she would rather not cater to people that are sinful. Now, you can argue that she has a right, it's a business, she has a right to decide who she serves. But according to the ruling at the time, um, the woman was deemed to have usurped the rights of those gay people. In fact, the law deemed that she owed service to them in spite of her religious beliefs. So these are really issues that, you know, as beautiful as democracy is, as, as much as it canvases equality, universality, in practice, there are still issues and gray areas that need to be resolved. Um, next slide, please. We're looking at the issues in modern day citizenship. Now there's also the private life versus public life dilemma. Um, the biggest example I will give of this is a certain senator. Um, I think he's from Adam Mawa. He, um, of course, as a senator, you're expected to be like, you know, a representative of your people, making laws to better the lives of your people, etc. You are supposed to be a model citizen, right? But this man may be out there making laws. I think the senator Abba or something like that, making laws, good laws for his people. But at the same time, in his private life, he was... Um, caught on camera assaulting attendants in a sex toy shop. Now, how can you say you are a model citizen, making laws for the good of the people, and then behind you are assaulting individuals? It's also, you know, a senator who says, or, uh, or uh, a, a public servant, it could be a governor, a commissioner, you know, any kind of public servant who outside is making laws, good laws, doing great. And then in the family, he's assaulting his wife at home. He is not there as a father figure to his children, or she's not there as a mother figure to her children. How then can we say you are a model citizen when what you do in public and what you do in private is a dissonance. So if we're talking about citizenship, then whether in private, whether in public, the rights of everybody should be protected. And then another common thing, and I, I'm sure, you know, if we, if we search, we'll find that some of us consciously, unconsciously, they are guilty of this as well. Um, in our places of work, especially where we have some level of influence, sometimes people decide that rather than employ somebody fits or the, the, the person most suited for a particular role, they will rather employ somebody that is from their, their own tribe or their own religion. And some of us consciously or unconsciously might find ourselves in this category as well. So when we're talking about citizenship, it's important that there is 
some kind of concord between private life and public life. Otherwise, everything we'll be talking about will just be lip service. We'll just be mounting our good citizenship. Meanwhile, in private, we are not modeling what it means to be a good uh, citizen. So these are some of the issues in modern day citizenship. And there are still debates as to how best to ensure that all of these different parts, whether it's individual versus collective, private versus public, are addressed in such a manner that the rights of everybody, which is what democracy is about, is protected. Next slide, please. And then, yes, um, societal contest when discussing citizenship, societal contest also matters. And it's important to recognize a few examples of what citizenship or what being a good citizen means in different climes. In South Africa, um, a country that suffered a lot under the apartheid at, at the time. When you talk of a model citizen, a model citizen is usually one who fights um, racism. Ask an average South African who is a model citizen. Model citizen, it has to be linked to the racism um, struggle. In Russia, for instance, they place more value on individuals' self-reliance over collective action. This is how um, the idea of citizen, citizenship is viewed in a, in a country like Russia. And in places where there have been, you know, war-torn countries, places like Syria, um, Uganda, and, you know, other parts where there have been plenty trouble, Iraq, where there have been plenty troubles, um, a good citizen is often seen as one who seeks peaceful resolutions and uh, reconciliation. Uh, so these are the, the critical issues in modern day citizenship. And it's important for us to, as we, as we strive to understand our role in, in, in today's world as citizens, it's important to understand these different challenges that this system of governance also poses. Because if we do not understand the challenges, then we cannot be the best um, uh, citizens that we can be. Next slide, please. Oh, and please, if you have questions, please just note them down. Um, at the end, I would attempt to provide answers to some of them um, as, as much as possible. Okay, the important question. Remember that our topic today is democracy, and citizen participation. So what makes a good citizen? Um, so far, we've looked at, you know, different forms of governance. I'm giving us a recap again. And then we've looked at the comparative advantage that democracy, which is ruled by many, has over other forms of government. And we've established the fact that a major theme or one of the reasons why democracy is popular in today's world is because it is thought to guarantee greater equality um, and um, rights for the people in the country or community. We have looked at, despite the fact that democracy in theory is supposed to be, you know, the best form of gov governance, the most representative, we have looked at the challenges, um, even in modern day citizenship. We've looked at how sometimes there is a clash between the individual in terms of 
our our faith, our gender, our class, our religion, in terms of you know our rights as individuals and then as a collective. We've seen sometimes that there's a dissonance between private life and public life. We've seen that in different parts of the world, based on the experiences that the people have had, citizenship or the ide ideal, ideal citizen, what it means can vary from one place to another. So given all of these challenges and all of this knowledge, what really makes a good citizen? As you know, there's no right answer, there's no wrong answer. But these are a few points that I have noted. Being informed and aware of social, economic, and political issues. Yes, this is very important. Um, being a good citizen, of course, it's good to be aware of who is going to be evicted or who was evicted in Big Brother um, last week. It's good to have an opinion or be informed about all the fights that have happened in the house. I mean, there's absolutely nothing wrong with all of that. It's good to, you know, be aware of the latest song. Whiskey dropped the song three days ago. Um, I, I, I listened to the song. Nice song. It's good to be aware of all of these things. But it's also important as model citizens to be informed about the social, economic, and political issues surrounding us. And I am particularly very proud of how many of us young people are beginning to follow political discourse. I see all the debates online, and I think um, Nigerian young people are coming of age because this is a country where the youths are a demographic majority, but we have been led for many years by the minority. So it is good to see that we have not left the issues of governance, politics, elections to the older generations, and we are now becoming aware. That's one of the positives um, that I see recently, and I'm very happy with, and I hope it continues. And that's an example of what a model citizen should be. You should be aware of everything that is happening um, economically, politically around you, not just Big Brother, not just music, not just um, entertainment. Um, a good citizen, is one who fosters tolerance and respect for human rights and all. Remember, just as you believe you are a Christian, you have your beliefs. There are Muslims. There are people who practice African traditional religion. There are Buddhists. There are people who are even atheists. It's important to remember that in a democracy, which is government or rule by the many, it is, it is important to remember and to make moves to ensure that while protecting or affirming your own rights, you do not usurp the rights of other people. This is important for a model citizen. You must foster tolerance and respect the rights of other people. It doesn't matter um, whether you believe that your religion is superior to others or not, or your way is the only way, or Igbo people are the best. Whatever you do, you must ensure that you also recognize that there are plenty variations, uh, plenty different people. And in a proper democracy, the rights of everybody should be guaranteed and should be protected. And a model citizen should do that. You should be concerned about taking steps to combat disadvantage and injustice. This point, I will explain in another slide uh, why we as a um, citizen have a role to play in correcting a lot of the injustices and some of the social vices that exist. It's not just for the government or the um, security agencies alone or NGOs alone. At molecular levels, even family units, we also have a responsibility and I would come to that later. A good citizen must protect, promote collective action and collective spirit, participate in community and national affairs. We also already talked about that. You know, all the debates, um, some people are obedient, some people are articulated, 
Some people are, I don't know what um, Tinumbo's followers call themselves or uh, Papua and so's followers, but it's good to see that, you know, people are, are discussing politics and how um, things can be better. And of course, a model citizen, this is very hard in a country like, like Nigeria, I must say. It is hard to be hopeful, but you can't call yourself a good citizen if you do not at least believe that the actions that you take or that people in your family take can bring about positive change in the society. Next slide. Now, I want to talk more about... The next slide, please. I want to talk more about what we, we should do um, to build active citizen advocacy. Um, No, I think before I go before I go to this slide, just keep the slide. Um, I want to harp on the point of doing our own bits to combat social injustices and inequalities and to address some of the vices in the society. Now, let me quickly spend some minutes to address that because it's important. Very many times we leave the issue of governance to people in government, but a society cannot advance, a society cannot grow if the people themselves do not actively participate in rebuilding the society. Um, what do I mean? All of us in our different spheres or areas have some influence. It may be in your family unit. It may be in your church. It may be in the position that you hold, you hold at the office. It may also be, um, I mean, in different places where we find ourselves, we have a role to play. Sometimes you could be at the beer parlor with your friends and you are drinking and somebody makes a joke, a joke, a distasteful joke, for instance, that objectifies women. As a model citizen, Everything can be humor to you. You can there and then correct your friend or, you know, cut them short when they do something that you feel um, is against any particular group of persons. Or you find somebody in front of you making jokes of, uh, making jests of people who are um, dwarfs, making jests of, you know, or talking about any particular group of people in a derogatory way. It is our responsibility, wherever we are, whether it's in our offices, whether it's in the beer parlor, to take action to correct those things. Because when we do not, we are aiding and abating these behaviors that eventually alienate certain members of the community or abuse the rights of other people. So all of us have a role to play, wherever we are. Don't think you... You need to be in government before you can play your part. A model citizen should be able to play their part. One, one, one time, um, some comedians were making jokes. I mean, sometimes people just want content, right? Um, social media is about likes and views. A comedian can come up today, or it used to happen. Some comedians will come, make jokes about maybe people who are lame, make jokes about people who are blind. As far as they are concerned, they are just making people laugh, right? But then those are members of the society that you are talking down on. And I think Ali Baba, um, as one of the most senior people in the comedy space, called all the comedians and then decided that we have to be more responsible in the kind of jokes that we crack. Yes, it's important to be funny and all of that, but in the process of building your content, of making people laugh, you don't make jest of a certain group of people. That's one of the ways that we can use, we can make a change in our little sphere of influence. Now, Alibaba is not a government person. He's just a comedian. But in that, his space is making sure he's sanitizing that industry so that the society can be better. Um, one of the examples I've made during this class in the past is about a, a blogger called Tunde Ednot who many of us, I believe, know, has massive, massive, you know, fan base, 
had his account closed and within days of opening another one, had millions of followers again. Now, that is power, soft power. He's not a governor, he's not a, a politician, but he wields some power because people follow him. Now, Tunde Edward used to have something he called smash or pass, where he would post women. And then he would ask people to ask if they would rather sleep with the person or the person would go. Now, you may view this as entertainment, right? Oh, it's entertainment. People laugh. Oh, the girl has a big, fine booty. Uh, this is that, that is that. And then you see some people say, oh, yes, this, our skin is this, our skin is that. At the end of the day, it may seem like content, but at the end of the day, what are you doing? You are objectifying women. So people who have influence, like Tunde Ednot, need to use their platforms in a more responsible manner. And you don't even have to be a Tunde Ednot. What are the kind of content you are posting in your own space, on your own page? What kind of contents are you circulating? Is your content helping to build or is it pulling down? These are personal responsibilities that we all must take. We don't all have to aspire to be to public office. We don't all have to be um, councillors, ward chairmen, uh, commissioners, or ministers, or governors, or president. But we all have a role to play. And within our own sphere of influence, we must do our bit. Some, some things that we normally would gloss over, laugh over, we need to be, take more responsibility and then um, do our bit to make the society better. Now, I'm rounding, rounding up in a bit. Building active citizen advocacy, what does it entail? To do this, we need to build public interest. And this is what I was explaining, um, part of it. Within our own sphere of influence, we need to start developing people's knowledge and critical consciousness to resist dominant values. This was what, just what I was explaining. Now, we need to promote civic education and advocacy training, which is why um, anytime I've been called up to give this class, I'm usually very happy to. Why? Uh, because I love what Electoral College is trying to do. Because the only way we can build the kind of society we want is if more and more people are aware of their roles and responsibilities as citizens. And this is what Electoral College stands for. And this is why this kind of forum or fora is important. Uh, so promoting civic education and uh, advocacy training as Electoral College is doing is great. We need to start this early though, reintegrate citizenship studies into school curricula, right from primary school down to uh, secondary school, university, and even at our workplaces, we should have some form of citizenship advocacy training within our organizations, within our churches. This is very, very important in building um, active citizen advocacy. And then, it's important to pursue broad-based citizen action. Um, if you want to find a course, it's important that we find people who share the same views, share the same values, and align with those people because there's power in numbers. Remember that popular uh, saying about a broom, the analogy about a, a single broom stick and then a bunch of broom. If we want the government to do something, if we want to pressure the government to do something, we can't go it alone. We need to find people who share similar ideologies, values, and form like a coalition and push our agenda. That is the only way, or the, the not the only way, but the, the most effective way uh, to bring about positive change in the society. Uh, and of course, uh, media advocacy is very, very important. The use of lobbyists. Um, it's good to talk about all of these issues um, at the electoral college forums, on TV, but we also need people lobbying um, at the legislative level, at the National Assembly, um, at the Senate. We need people who are there lobbying for policies um, that would ensure that the rights of, of every Nigerian citizen is protected. Broad-based citizen action is important 
um, in building active citizen advocacy. The final slide, I believe, the final slide, which is basically a summary of this three uh, points that I just raised. Advocacy that is geared to building citizenship and reshaping political culture draws heavily on the theory and practice of participation and popular education. A new practice of citizen leadership requires an integrated strategy involving participatory education processes to build people's ability to analyze their reality and internalize their rights as citizens. It also takes new alliances and broad-based democratic organizations that tap the power of working together as well as respecting and using people's difference. And ladies and gentlemen, um, that has been my time. Um, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to share my experience and knowledge with you. And um, if you have questions, um, I think we can, uh, with our facilitators um, helping us, we can take some questions now. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Tony. Uh, so now for the question, can we have uh, Shukuma unmute yourself and ask your question, please? Uh, good evening, Paul. Good evening. This is an interesting class, the interesting lecture that you just delivered now. I want to ask, you talked about um, the model citizen and you give examples of who is considered the model citizen in Russia, another example of that in Uganda. So I want to ask, in Nigeria, what do Nigerians consider as uh, a model citizen? Okay, thank you, Chukuka. Um, I'm sure if you asked all of us, the answers would, would vary. Um, I thought it was important to, to show that when you talk of citizenship, context is important because certain countries have certain peculiar experiences. And um, I mentioned South Africa um, and because of the apartheid history and all of that. When you discuss the citizenship subject, a model citizen automatically for the average South African is one who fights racism. I mean, it doesn't mean that that is all a model citizen does. It's just because apathy is really strong, a strong part of their, their history, which is why I used that example. And then I cited Russia and then conflict reading areas. In Nigeria, um, as varied as the people are, so will the answers to this question be. So what I did uh, was to just draw some of the more basic things. And like I said, I said that when I was, when I was even present, I said there's no right or wrong answer, but based on, you know, um, experiences and, you know, feedback from people, these are some of the things that a model citizen is expected of a model citizen. Um, I mean, you can revisit the slide later to see most so the, but there are things that you already know. Um, somebody who would stand up um, and ensure that the rights of other people are protected, not just their own. Um, somebody who would combat negative stereotypes or negative attitudes. I talked about um, um, some influencers in quotes using their platforms to correct some of the, the ills. Um, there, are, there are discussions that we have on several platforms where if we're not careful because we want to be funny or entertaining, we encourage bad behavior. I cited people who objectify women when I was talking of Tunde Edna. I cited examples of comedians that make joke of certain class of people. Um, in the same vein, 
There are people who talk down on women generally, um, uh, women being worthless, um, men being much more valuable than women, the girl child being less valuable than the boy child. I mean, a model citizen in their own flair of influence should be able to correct some of this, in quotes, negative stereotypes. Um, honestly, Chukuka, there's really no one answer that we can give to um, describe what a model Nigerian citizen should be. But it's all of those things that I itemized in my presentation, which I believe will be shared with you after this, and a lot more than that, because if I asked you, I'm sure you also have your own um, perception of what you think or who you think a model citizen should be. I hope that answers it, Chukuka. I hope you're satisfied. I hope Chukuka okay. is, but we can have another question. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I am about to call um, Idris Kende to actually unmute so she can uh, ask, ask her or his question. Okay. Good, good evening, everybody. Thanks to the facilitator for this uh, insightful presentation. Uh, the person talking is a male. That is the first thing. Uh, <laughs> I would like to I would like to paint a scenario. So okay. I want you to light us around this thing. In, in, in the look of democracy and citizen, I'm looking at the way government brings some law. It seems it's against the citizen because it's as if they are starting the citizen to, um, I wouldn't want to say to enrich themselves or in the name they want to make money for the government. I will cite an example example of two things. Number one, the international passport. Because there's a need to increase the pages of international passport, they did uh, an additional uh, pages to some passport. Because of the printer, I wouldn't know. It has a delay. And now, for citizens to get that particular things, I think you will pay through your nose. Is this Democracy favoring the citizen, that is one leg. Second leg, the vehicle plate number. Before the regime of Jonathan, there was a plate number that started with alphabet before the local government at the end. Now, the change is that it starts with local government and end with alphabet. It doesn't, uh, the, the, the first one did not take longer time before they bring the second one, that money. And they brought in another law that the plate number they did for us, that is already fading, and they are charging us for not changing it. Who produce plate number that is not last long, and you are now charging the citizen for driving with faded uh, plate number. I look at this thing. Uh, the policy from this democracy favoring the citizen, or they are using it to extort the citizen. Please, especially on it. Sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Um, first and foremost, as sad as the scenarios you painted are, um, these problems or different societies, not just Nigeria, have their own peculiar problems. There's no, there's no country where democracy is being practiced that doesn't have its own challenges. And I have not sat here through this um, discussion we've had and said that democracy is not without problems. In fact, I was quick to say, um, despite being the most popular system of governance around the world, I, and I spend time to say, you know, a lot of the challenges that has to do with democracy and modern day citizen. Um, yes, but I will come back to the what how I started. Our leaders are a reflection of the people. We cannot run away from it. So if we feel that we have bad leaders, it simply means that we are bad followers. 
I'm sorry, but that is the truth. Because in a democracy, it is the people that elect their leaders. And if through the electoral process, these people in government are the best we can produce, then it says a lot about us as followers. So first things first, we must take responsibility that our leaders are a reflection of us, the followers, the citizens, and our choices. That is the first point I wish to make. The second point is many of the policies or actions of government that do not favor us. We actually, apart from electing the right people into office, which is the first way we can address many of the ills in the society, making sure that we are not voting based on tribe and ethnicity, based on what we get, 55,000 naira or gari, uh, bag of gari and rice that they will share to us or rappers and all of that. Apart from making sure that we use our votes wisely, we get involved in the electoral process and have the right leaders there. Apart from that, as citizens, we can also form pressure groups. So for instance, the issue of the um, uh, national passports that you talked about and the number plates, you can start a movement of young people, start a um, hashtag on Twitter, start to write letters to editors of different newspapers about the problems. The more people are talking about these ills, the more the people in charge of those areas, whether it's the Nigeria Immigration Service or whichever um, body is responsible for um, issuing plate number FRSC or I don't know who, or the VIO, I don't know which agency of government is in charge of that. The more vocal we are about how we feel about these issues, the more pressured the people are and the greater the chances of, of a change happening. So it is a challenge to you and to everybody listening to me. First and foremost, in the coming elections, we must ensure that we do our best and encourage the people within our own flow of influence to elect only people that we believe have not just the um, competence, but the willpower to do what is best to move the country forward, not vote for people because they are our brothers or sisters or because we benefit from them. Secondly, we need to use our voice more. This is the only way to address the ills we have. And we don't even have to be in government to do that. I just cited um, a social uh, media um, advocacy against some of those issues that you mentioned. These are ways that we can effect change. But democracy everywhere is not without its challenges. But as more citizens get involved, we can use our power, our voice, to bring about the change that we want. I hope that answers it. Yes, can we take more questions or? Okay. So, yeah. uh, uh, Paul Chidi, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Paul Chidi, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay, good evening. Are you hearing me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you, Paul Chidi. Unmute yourself. You have not unmuted yourself, Paul Chidi. Paul Chidi, unmute yourself, please. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Good evening. Thank Good evening. you, Mr. Tony, for these wonderful lectures. Well, I just want to go straight to my question. In terms of democracy, you talked about direct and indirect democracy. I want you to please show more light on direct democracy. You talked that it's um, a form of government in which the citizen itself makes its own legislative decisions. So I want yeah. to get more, um, as more idea about direct democracy okay. and what to do any states that practice the direct democracy. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So the, the most um, common example, I mean, in recent times that I can 
site is Brexit. You, you do remember Brexit. I, I want to believe you remember Brexit. Brexit was um, Britain campaigning to exit from their membership of the European Union, the EU. So Brexit, Brexit was the slogan um, when the, the, the Brit British government wanted to exit from their participation as a member of the EU. Now, in order to do that, they did what is called a referendum. And a referendum is actually the people, not just elected representatives, but the people coming to say, we want to be parts or we don't want to be parts of the EU. And Brexit only happened because the people decided. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think there was also such a refer referendum about one of the one of the countries in the United Kingdom. I don't know if it's Ireland or you know one of them, but I I don't want to mislead you now. But one of the countries in the UK also voted for whether to be part of the UK or to exit from the UK. I'm not really sure. If anybody remembers, you can put it. You can you know put it in the chat section to educate all of us. But I can check this afterwards. Those are examples of the people um, directly um, deciding their own fate. Now, Nigeria does not practice that kind of um, participatory uh, democracy yet. They are advocating for it. People are advocating for it. Um, but up until now, I do not think that um, there has been any provision for the people to um, um, particularly decide on a lot of these issues. Remember that they've been calling for um, a sovereign national conference. Um, different, over different administrations, we've heard talk of a sovereign national conference, and the aim of all of this national conference is to decide whether we want to um, stay as a country or not. And the, the the constitution of this sovereign national conference is, you know, different parts coming together to say, yes, we want to, or we don't want it. It's supposed to be more representative than just uh, the people in the, in the upper and lower chamber. It's supposed to um, have more people from different tribes uh, making up this conference. But all the different regimes, government regimes, have not let that happen so far. Um, so yeah, direct democracy simply means more of the people um, voting on decisions that affect them as against indirect, which is what we practice here most of the time, where we elect certain people to represent us. And those people, either based on our expressed wishes will do what we ask them to do or use their own judgment to act on our behalf. So in Nigeria, what we practice is really the indirect um, democracy. Even though there are, there are sparks here and there, people advocating for a more representative um, kind of you know, um, democracy, but we have not got there yet. Uh, so the best example um, in answer to your question is the Brexit example. Uh, that's, that's, that's an example of um, citizens directly involved in deciding their own fate. And uh, that's the uh, British referendum. I hope that answers your question. Okay, Paul Chidi. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, B Billy Nang, Paul, please. Uh, you can unmute yourself, Billy Nang Paul. Unmute yourself and ask your question, please. Hello, are you hearing me? Yes, we can hear hey. you. Go ahead. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm Nang Billy Paul. Um, I want to appreciate the organizers of this book, um, Electoral College <clears throat> training. Mine is, yeah, it has been a general talk on national security when it comes to issues. So, as a modern citizen, I want to understand when one has an information that he wants to reveal or he has a team that is working on something that is bene will benefit the citizens. But those informations are stamped intact for national security. How can, how can one have such kind of situations? Because we have seen so many things happen in this nation now. 
So whenever one, just like the late Obadiah Melafia, when he was revealing some information and um, before you knew he was being tracked by the GSS and other um, security agencies. Now, what me I want to know is as a natural, as a net, um, nat as a modern citizen now, with all the challenges within this nation in which we know is security. Now, how can one devolve information since we are talking about the democracy system of government? Yes. Now, what we want to do in situations that you are seeing something that is affecting the people, but is on the it's list of hard to come and voice your opinion about because it of, because of fear of yeah. I, I totally to understand you. Totally understand you, Billy Nam Paul. Thanks for for that question. Um, it's it's really unfortunate that the security agencies, especially um, the Nigeria Police Force, over the years has had its image completely battered. Because for citizen to for citizens to be able to for in fact for there to be peace and security, the security agencies, particularly the police, cannot do it alone. They need the uh, collaboration um, uh, and support of citizens uh, in order for there to be peace and security. However, because there's distrust between the security agencies and the people, people with information, useful information, are not able to come out, are not able to come out. I mean, you could even go on social media today and tweet something, and the DSS will be after you, like you rightly said. So we are in a very, very, um, how would I put it, in a very terrible situation in this country with, with regards to that. And that's because the people do not trust um, the police force or the security agencies. Um, it's unfortunate. Um, I wouldn't advise you to do something that would get you into trouble, you know. But if we had better representation, for instance, from the grassroots level, from our local um, government chairman to our house of rep, you know, at both the upper and lower chamber, if we had better representation and we had better access to these people, which is what we need to actually promote more, um, making sure that these people are accountable to us, those can be channels for some of this information that we have. Um, some things you don't have to perhaps go directly to be in a proper society, go to the um, inspector general of police. When, for instance, you have your LCDA chairman, some governance should actually be local than, you know, having a central point where, because it is at the local government level that you can touch the lives of citizens. And citizens within a locality know one another. So if something is happening that is affecting them, you can easily go to your elected representatives. Um, so I understand, Billy Nang Paul, the challenge here. And I think everything goes back to the same answer that I gave to one of the questions asked. In order for there to be proper change, we need to start by electing the right people into offices at all levels. We shouldn't only be concerned about the presidential elections or the governorship elections. We should be uh, concerned about the people, the ward chairman, the councillors, LCDA chairman, because those are the people that we should have access to. When there's any problem within the community, those are the people we should have access to. So it's when we start to have the right people in office, trust will increase. We will be freer to walk into their offices, have our suggestions, or information that can help the community sent to them. Um, but the current situation of distrust does not help matters. Um, I don't know what to advise you here, but as a collective, I think we should start getting more involved, which is what we've been preaching, in choosing the people that lead us. If we choose our own people, we will trust them better. It will be easier to go forward um, with information and, uh, information and suggestions as to how to make things better. I would have suggested, like I said uh, to another question, some maybe social media movement, but you could tweet something now and that thing can get you into trouble. 
So I would not advise that because I know the kind of country that we're in. I can't act as if I am not a Nigerian living in Nigeria myself. Um, but I think, you know, at Fora, where we have the opportunity, uh, some of us, if we get into places where we have the opportunity, we need to task the police force. Um, I like the current um, um, spokesperson for the police in Lagos State, uh, because I live in Lagos. I know he's a very accessible person. Um, he, he, he calls into radio stations when people have complaints and he gives police feedback. He's on Twitter answering questions. If you complain about something, he checks and comes back. That's how it should be. Unfortunately, it's not like that everywhere in the country and it will take time. So the police needs proper restructuring so the people can trust them. Um, overall, our leadership needs total restructuring and it will start, um, I believe, with the choices we make at the next elections. Unfortunately, that's the best I can advise Billy and Paul at this time. Thank you very much, um, uh, Facilitator Tony. Uh, so yeah. can I ask uh, Oke Ari Omoro to mute, unmute himself and ask his question? Oke Ari Omoro. Yeah, uh, good evening, please. This is uh, OK, Harry Omoro speaking. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. OK, uh, I really want to thank, I want to thank the last speaker, Billy Nag Paul, because the question he, he, he threw before us is actually one of the questions I tend to ask. Now, having said that, um, my little question or should I say contribution or whatever, whichever we want to say, but let me share with us. Now, community policing is also a part of participation in our immediate communities, in our immediate environment. Now, I have seen a situation whereby it happened often, a situation whereby um, probably uh, a criminal, a culprit is caught in the act of committing a crime, either stealing or something of that nature. And immediately, some other people will come in and they manifest what, what we believe to be jungle justice, and that be the person to stupor, at times people say the person are blaze and all that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As, as, a, as, yes, as a proper citizen of a nation, you are not supposed to also indulge in such acts. What you are supposed to do is, recently I find out that uh, the constitutions approve uh, individual arrests. Individual arrest in the sense that you can you can get hold of somebody committing a crime, you bring in the police, and the person will be formally taken to the police station for interrogations. Now, having done that, the stress at which the police or the people prosecuting the person subject this person to is quite too much. They always want you to come to the station today to write your statement. Fine, I know that yes, at least to testify that yes, you call this person committed this crime red-handedly. Now, having written your, your, your statement, any day they want to visit the case, at times they may even decide to, to, to transfer that case from your vicinity to another distant place. Maybe they claim to be because of security reasons and all that. And they always want you to come to the court to testify without making a provision for other, for even for your transport and all that. There are some persons that are even working, they will not even give you official permission so that you can attend that your workplace, so that you could have the opportunity of having that um, time of going to the court to even testify against these persons. So all these things are beginning to make people not to even participate in some of the immediate things we are supposed to carry out in our various uh, environments. But community policing is quite important, but because of the implication and this and all that, it, it makes people to feel less concerned. If anything is happening, sir, they will say, ah, you know, concern me if I involve myself now, I'm a police go take China. You know, you know from, from these studies, it is another venue. This is another venue for some of these things to be brought to people in, 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 in a leadership cadres. Uh, we know we are not practicing a direct democracy. In as long as we are practicing a representative democracy, we should also cry out to our various representatives. These things are eating up in our various communities and environment. They should provide solutions to it so that anybody that is willingly coming to serve the community as a good citizen will not be having this fear at the back of his or her mind. And that is my submission. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that beautiful submission, Okay. 
Harry, um, everything you said is just brilliant. Um, yes, community policing is very important. And it still goes back to the issue I mentioned before, the distrust between the people and the police. So the police needs to work on, on their image. We talked about restructuring and all of that. It's, it's really very, very important because you want to do something right, but you are afraid that in doing something right, they will stress you. It's the same thing when you, you help somebody um, that has had an accident and then you get to the hospital and the next day you are in trouble because you helped somebody on the road. You know, you know things like you live in a society where you are afraid to do good because you think the good you do will come back to haunt you. So I am in total agreement with all your submission. Um, that's why I said some of us who have um, access to certain people in, in, you know, different influential areas should push for some of these changes to happen the best we can. Um, but everything that we have talked about still goes back to the kind of leaders that we elect at all levels. Uh, people usually talk about the presidency and the governorship, but you see, the local government chairmen are powerful too. The LCDA people, they are, they are all powerful people too. And they have roles to play. So if we choose the people carefully in all of these positions, I believe we can start to change the entire structure, not just of governance and our security architecture, by having the right people in place. I saw some questions before we go to another question. Some people asked, how do you know the right people? And I saw some brilliant answers too. Uh, somebody, uh, a rather funny one, said, the right person is not somebody that wants to rule because it is my turn. I know what you are talking about, but I pretend like I do not know what you are talking about. Okay. Uh, somebody said, is it somebody with competence or somebody with a godly heart? Um, all of the, there are many factors in deciding who the right people should be. But more importantly, we don't see people's hearts, but we see their skills and then their manifesto. Let them come and tell us um, what they can do. If they tell us what they can do, it's not even enough to tell us what they can do. What have they done? What is their precedent? What is their uh, CV like? The places where they have managed, whether in government or private um, sectors, what was their um, achievement? What were, what, what were their achievement? What was their performance like? So because manifestos this day can, can be written by, by anybody. I can pay a consultant to write a good manifesto for me to present to the public. But do, do I have the competence and the willpower to be able to um, effect or execute that manifesto? That's an important question. So much more than the manifesto that the politicians are coming up, it's important. Let them tell us what they want to do. Um, Alaji Atiku Abubakar released his manifesto to the media the other day. I expect the other people to do the same thing. But like I said, manifestos can be written by consultants. You pay consultants to do that. But how do you, how do you know that somebody will do what they said they have done? Um, you would know if in the past, when the person had been vested with power, you would have an idea what they can do tomorrow by what they did yesterday this i mean there's no we can't see into people's heart right we there's no way we can know that people will say what they will do but we have pointers that can guide us and help us to see who is who is genuine um more important importantly let's check their background do they have the educational qualification um not i remember during the last election somebody said if somebody has only nepa certificates we will vote for the person. I hope we will never find ourselves in a situation where the choices are so bad that we have to vote for somebody that only has a NEPA certificate and not school certificate. So is the person educated enough uh, to lead? Is the person competent? How do you judge competence? What have they managed, whether in public or private sphere? And then what is their manifesto? Those are some of the areas, uh, things that we can look at in deciding um, who uh, a good candidate is. 
Um, and it will help, like somebody said, if the person has a godly heart, but there's no way of knowing that. We don't see into people's heart. We can only see their works. So let's choose people who have good works to show um, so that we can hold them to account if they do not uh, do what they say they will do. And then, sorry, before uh, I hand over to the facilitator, um, we were talking about referendum before, and I was talking of some country that wanted to exit from the United uh, Kingdom. Uh, and I see in the comments that it is actually Scotland. I had mentioned Ireland, I wasn't sure. But thank you to, um, I think it's Choma Okuruma and some other people who wrote there that, um, that um, Scotland is the country. Um, so I hope we've taken note of that. Thank you. Uh, precious, please, Precious Unwacha, please unmute and ask your question. All right. Um, good evening, everyone. And um, thank evening. you very much, uh, Tony, for the powerful um, content you are delivering this evening. So my, the, while speaking, we did mention that um, part of the, the aim or part of the dream is to see citizens take, take on more roles as makers and shapers. And in my understanding, that invariably leads to in advocacy, just like you mentioned, advocacy and advocacy movements, you know, broad-based movements like that. Now, my question is, uh, is, at what point now, or how, not at what point, how do we make sure? Because invariably, some of these movements grow so big that they cut across all divides, a lot of mem um, um, a large membership and all. And then these citizens are also supposed to be politically wise and then participate also. So how do we keep that divide, that in line that maybe I, I feel must exist between the advocacy itself and then partisan politics. You know, for instance, someone has um, like what we're doing here, which will eventually grow. And then there are people who identify as, okay, I come from this background, I'm part of this movement and all. And then they have to involve in politics. How, do, how does it not begin to look like, okay, this Allah body is, has, has this leaning? You know, yes. politically partisan linear. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, Precious. The concern you raised is a very valid one. Um, so, I when I was introduced, I was introduced as convener of the Edo movement, and during the last election in Edo, um, I and many of the Edo professionals, young Edo professionals, actually took a stand behind a governor. Now, usually we are not a partisan group. All we are canvassing for is good governance, inclusive governance for our people. But you see, there comes a, a time where it's not just enough to be pointing out all of the ills, you know, that there are. You need to put your money where your mouth is, um, as the saying goes. So at some point, we said to ourselves, we can't keep saying this. We've seen the choices there are. And we've examined, we are professionals. We are not, you know, I mean, everybody is valuable in a society, but we are learned people, we're professionals. We've looked at these different people. We've studied the history of the state. We've seen how the state has been mismanaged by a certain um, group of people. We've seen the um, CVs of the main actors and we decided, you know what? We're going to stay behind this person. And I think this is the fear that you are talking about where you move from being the voice of reason to actually leaning towards a political party or a political ideology and all of that. It's a thin line really. Um, but if your motive is good, if your motive is good, um, you have to just go with it. And sometimes you don't even need to be part of a big block, um, which is why I say individual responsibility in our own little sphere. It's not until you are part of an organized group before you can make your voice heard. In the beer palo, as you are sitting and watching Arsenal match, and somebody is saying something that is totally negative, 
you can start by correcting that. In fact, I'm, I'm talking too far. It is, the beer parlor is too far. How about in your house with your brothers and sister? Your, your sister expresses a view that brings a particular um, people down. Your duty at that point, the way you are making a change is by correcting your sister, your child, your son, your brother, your father, your mother to say, ah, Papa, that view that you hold, it's not progress, it's not a progressive view. And back it up with facts and say politely, of course, we have to be polite in passing our message, you know? So everything comes from what we, what we really, really want, what we really, really wish for. And you have to put your money where your mouth is as far as you can go. I know that that danger exists where from being, you know, um, a pressure group, some people can even get monies from politicians and they abandon why, you know, they were set up in the first place. I've seen it happen very many times. People start with very good, you know, start their organizations with very good uh, uh, motives. But at some point, politicians call the leadership behind and give them money. And then they endorse a politician based on money. I'm not saying everybody does that, but I've seen it happen very many times. And this risk is there. But we won't say because this risk is there, we would stop pushing for what is good and what is right. As long as your conscience is clear that what you are doing to the best of your knowledge and your ability is what will move the country forward, will, what will make us progress as a people. Trust your instincts, go with it, fight for it as much as you believe, and hopefully everything works out um, for good, hopefully. But there's never a way to you know, know this because there's a thin line, like you rightly mentioned, between this. You only have to trust your, your good intention, your good heart, and just follow through as much as you can. That's, that's what I can say, Precious, and I hope, I hope that's sufficient. Okay, uh, thank you, sir, for the response. Um, let's move on to um, Anthony Emmanuel Ian to unmute. Anthony Emmanuel Ian, please unmute and ask your question, please. Okay, um, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Anthony. All right, good evening, and thank you, Satuni, for all what you have been doing. And I think uh, I, I enjoyed the class, though sometimes I missed. Okay, Mike, uh, I have um, a lot of questions, but some of them have been answered by you. But then there's um, these two ones that I have. Um, you talk about um, the leaders are the reflections of the followers. And I'm still thinking because a lot of things is passing through my mind. For example, this, um, this particular election that we are preparing for in um, 2023, um, you look, look at a lot of people that you join hand together to reason them in the right direction, going... I think they are going in the right in the wrong direction now. But then how do we that are understanding the, these things? Because you know, you also uh, talk about the issue of um uh choosing the right leaders by what they have done before. For yeah. example, this present government was um uh, came in on that ground that Buari did it in 2000, uh, sorry, 1980 something, uh, issue yeah. of corruption. He did it before, but he couldn't do it again this time around. Maybe because of the political win and other things that we don't know. And even sorry, now, on sorry, Anthony, day, some people will even argue with you that did he really do it at that time, or was it his deputy who actually did it? Was, but that's an argument for another day. Sorry, I just wanted to say that. Yeah. Okay, but then we, they, I think that they sold it for us 2014 15, and we, we bought it very well. But it's failing. So now and I'm, I'm I am seeing the same thing, the same direction we are going again in this time. You know, APC, PDP, and Labour Party. If the leaders are the truly, uh, truly um, the reflection of the followers, how do the good followers choose the right leaders? So that the bad followers will now align to them because um, someone even posted in the group in the chat box now, not my not forgetting the 
the stomach infrastructure that is very, very important in the issue of voting. Someone would just give it like I in my area now, they are sharing one APC is sharing 50,000 naira to some people and they called me. They have started already. So you can, and those people know that they will not vote APC, but they are collecting that money. Now, not only collecting that money, they are bringing other people that will not be able to stand like them, collect the money and vote your mind. But all the others will collect the money and vote. So how do we make sure we balance this thing so that everybody will think in the right direction? Thank you very Anthony, much. Sir. Anthony, I feel your sure. frustration. And I know that this is, this is uh, the frustration of many Nigerians. Um, one of the things that people who want to hold Nigeria back keep saying, um, they say that um, elections are not won on social media. They are right, but their motive is wrong. The, their motive is wrong because they are right because elections are actually not won on social media, but they are trying to yeah. undermine the movement that has started on social media. Social media yes. has a huge role to play. But they are wrong um, in saying that they are, they are right in saying that you know election is not one on social media because people have to actually vote. So you look at the number of people who have internet access who are on social media. What is the percentage compared to you know the people, the poor masses there who don't even know what is happening on the social media? What is the ratio? of these people. So whatever it is we're doing on social media, um, in terms of advocating for the candidate of our choice, we need to replicate it offline as well, in terms of grassroots um, mobilization and all of that. And I'm happy, I'm happy that young people, especially now, I see the discourse everywhere. People are more interested in politics. Young people are talking about the next election. They are talking about their preferred candidate. And they are backing up and they are fighting and all of the all, all I wish people would be more respectful, you know, of one another in this discourse. But I'm happy that the discourse is happening because a couple of years back it wasn't happening. I did mention that the young people in Nigeria are a demographic majority, but for so long we've left the issue of governance, uh, deciding what our leaders are, to people who are a minority. That is changing now. Now, what you and I want in terms of the criteria for choosing the right leader, it may or may not happen with the next election, but it doesn't mean we are not progressing towards where we are going. So don't lose faith that sometimes people will still vote leaders, not based on the criteria that we discussed, you know, competence, um, um, record of achievement, manifesto, and all of that. People will still vote because of stomach infrastructure. We can't rule that out, especially those who are offline, who are not you know, part of the social media movement, uh, who only think in terms of what goes into their tummy. Those people will still vote who they want. But whether or not, at the end of the day, our effort amounts to putting the people that we be, in quote, intellectuals or the you know, educated ones, and invested ones feel should be the people to hand over power to whether or not we achieve it now it is it is not going to be a failure it is a step forward so you can only do the best you can um, but i think we are moving gradually towards that um a couple just four years ago we didn't have as much young people interested in in politics and election as we are now that is progress Forget what people yeah. are saying yeah. about the elections are not one on social media. People don't have structure. Blah, blah, blah. See, it's starting. What you start off online, it will go offline. It may take time. It may not happen now, 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 now. But it doesn't mean it is failing. It means we're actually progressing. So we need to keep that same energy and try whatever we're doing online, try to replicate it offline as well because elections is actually people going to polling uh, stations to vote. You know, um, Nigeria doesn't yet accept um, online voting and diaspora voting and all of that. So people in the diaspora um, who want to help this country, our brothers and sisters out there, what do they do? They need to talk to their family members in Nigeria in the villages and encourage them and tell them why they need to do vote for XYZ person based on XYZ criteria. That's the best we can do. And we need to do it whether or not we get who we want now. It is still victory. 
If we don't get it now, in the next election, we will definitely get it. So that's the only encouragement I want to give you. Do, do the best you can, but don't feel discouraged. If what you feel is at the best hands, don't get it now. We need to continue with that energy um, and then things will get better from here. It can go, it can only get better. The way young people are getting involved now, um, very soon we would have a crop of leaders who are actually representative of, of the majority, not the kind of leaders we are, we are, we've had in the past. We'll get there. It's a, it's a movement, it has started. And I'm not talking in terms of any particular candidate. Notice I've not mentioned any candidate. I'm just saying the interest that young people have in politics is amazing. And we need to keep that energy online. Also try to replicate it offline, not just in these elections, but in the next one. Gradually we'll get there. We're we progressing, we're progressing. All right, thank you, sir. Yes. So, um, thank you. Uh, Sir, so can we have uh, okay Arimoro as the last person asking questions? So I'm please. going to ask questions. Yes, good evening, please. I'm here again, please. Something just came to my mind. As uh, people like us who have not been really involved in politics before this time, now that we're beginning to develop our interest, we'll find out that, uh, for instance, the state governor, the, qualif the educational qualification of a state governor and that of the local government chairman is the minimum of a uh, the school sacks. And now, what we find out that uh, the secretary to the local government, I don't know of that state and the, the, the uh, federal government, but the secretary of the, of the local government, they require that the person must be a graduate of the minimum of 10 years or a barrister at law before he can serve at that capacity. Uh, would that be, I don't know, where is that one coming from? Or is it... Um, Something we should take or we should consider again. I don't know. So that's why I need to bring up this question because if we are asked, I will not be able to answer it. Having passed through electoral college like that, such questions are also relevant for us to know. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Okeari. Um, I, I, don't, I don't have the facts of uh, the scenario you just painted in, in your state. Um, I'm only speaking, everything I've said is just based on general, you know, understanding of our roles as, you know, citizens in wherever we are. Um, of course, there are policies and laws that may not seem favorable, but those policies and laws were not written by spirits. They were written by our own representatives. So um, two things, everything I've, say, I, I've said so far still revolves around the same thing. From the next elections, let's make sure we try to get the right people into office first. Secondly, whatever policies of government that we do not like or laws and all of that, let's come together, form small, small blocks, whether it is social media, whether it is a direct engagement on TV station, whether it's writing letters to editors. I have done videos and posted about different issues on my own page, personally, or as part of my 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 movement and personally movement. too yes i have done it if you you can you can go to i am a dope page on facebook you see several videos that i made over there talking to leaders talking to tinumbo talking to obaseki go you'll see those things there those are things that i did as an individual and as a member of a group um talking against things that you like or don't like um when the answers matter was happening i led my i'm not saying everybody can do that but in our own little ways, in our small, small blocks, we can start to talk about the things that we don't like. Please do not think that these people are not listening. They are now afraid. They are very, very afraid. It was before that they thought that the views of people did not matter. In fact, one of the governors, I think it was Governor Baseki, he was addressing um, fellow politicians and he was saying, um, these people don't want us again. They are in every house. They have, they call themselves, there's a video that was circulated, they call themselves obedient and all of that. Obedience. I mean, it doesn't matter who, who he was calling, but the point he was making is people are now waking up. So it's not going to be business as usual. Now, we are getting to a stage where 
somebody will go representing you, you voted for the person. We, the people, will gather ourselves and say, no, we want to recall this person. We have the power to recall people who are not representing us well. But we need to start mounting the pressures in small, 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 small different places. Then from small, small groups, we start to join, join, everything, amplify the voices. I'm telling you, um, the people, the leadership, they know that it's no longer business as usual. So every effort that we're doing in our small, small areas, don't think that it's, it's wasted. All of those little, little things we're doing, they will amount to something big. We all need to just do our bits in our different areas and for stronger voice where we can, where we can have synergies. Let us find people with same synergize, you know, whether it's to go on media advocacy, whether it's to write about those things that we do not like, like uh, this qualification issue that you were talking about, you know, harp on it. Sometimes I do letters to editors, I'm in PR, but sometimes on some of this national issue, I will write my view, to, uh, some papers will publish it. Sometimes they call me to analyze issues on, on TV and I see it as an opportunity to, you know, talk about some of these things, but we don't all have to be on TV. We don't all have to write in the small, small places. Let's do what we can. That's all I can say. Yeah. Okay. All right. So thank you very much. Uh, we don't have any more questions. And thank you, uh, Mr. Tony. We really, really, really appreciate you um, on behalf of the uh, Electoral College Nigeria. And of course, my, uh, I call her my provost um, um, of uh, this, this school um, uh, in the person of Lisa Wumi. I really want to say a big thank you. And for this, this in-depth, analysis, lecture, and facilitation that you're giving to us today. Um, and we thank you for your time. Uh, we thank you for everything. You've been very, very informative. You've been educative. And yes, same again, we'll have to meet tomorrow. Uh, and like I initially said, please, um, let all not leave before the class ends. It is really, really wrong. It is wrong. It is not encouraging the school. We do not appreciate this. Please stay till the class ends so you can actually learn one thing or two. Thank you very much. Um, let me sign out and allow um, my August morning. Thank and you. Me. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank I'm you, sure sir. To send On behalf the... of the college. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. We've sent the material to the. Oh, okay. Students. Okay. Yes, we have. Yeah. Thank you, sir. All right. All right. Thank you all. Have a lovely evening. Yes. All right. So you too. Please, you can kindly help us end the class, sir. You have the host function. Oh, really?